everyone, and welcome to episode 169 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, I usually do a back-to-school podcast, so this year I've been cruising around social media and seeing what some of the trends are about school, and what I'm seeing a lot of is anxiety about going to school, whether that is you're a student and you're going to school and you're not sure what you're going to take, how that's going to affect your future, or perhaps you're a teacher, you're a member of the faculty that doesn't have a very secure position and you're not sure what your next steps are going to be. So I'm seeing a lot of that stuff around and all of it is perfectly understandable. (laughs) I thought maybe it would be helpful to you if I spent this podcast episode telling you about my story because my road to this point in my life and career was not at all linear. (laughs) I mean, I hit a whole bunch of brick walls before I got here. And I feel like a lot of times in life, there is this weight put upon every decision, like every decision is going to be so huge. And it could be, you know, a big problem if you don't make the right decision. So I thought today I would tell you my story so you can see my successes and especially my failures and to see how I got to this point. It's not my usual MO to talk about myself and you are free to skip this episode if it's not your jam, but I figured it's just you and me today. Even my sound editor has a week off, so it's just you and me. I'll talk you through as a friend how I got to this position in life so that you maybe can take it a little bit easier on yourself when you are faced with these really big decisions and just realize that it can turn out just the way you want it to, whether it looks like that at the outset or not. So grab yourself a cup of tea or put on your walking shoes and we'll have a quick cozy chat as friends right after this. So in high school, I was a music kid and I was a theater kid. And when I was leaving high school, what I really wanted to be was an actor. But I had the idea that you needed an education in my head. So instead of just striking out for the stage, what I did was I applied to one of the best programs uh, for theater in Canada. And I managed to get in. So that was great. So I spent my first year at university studying theater and I absorbed as much as I could. And I really learned a lot about my South through residence, as I'm sure everyone who's lived through residence can relate. But when it came to the end of the year, I had to audition to get into the second year of the program, and I blew it. It was really kind of a strange thing because if you're somebody who knows me, you know that I'm really big about attention to detail. I'm like anal about making sure I get my details right. And I'd actually missed a really important instruction on the sheet. And they called me on it in the audition, and I just froze, not realizing what it was that I had missed. I went back to my dorm room and I looked at the paper and I'd missed something huge. So that was a really strange moment for me. And as it turned out, I didn't get into the program I wanted to for the next year. So I went back home. I cried a bit, as you do. I talked to my mom and she reminded me that I wasn't really myself in that program anyway. So it was perfectly okay to just take a second and reassess, maybe think about what I wanted to do next. What I decided to do was not to finish my degree at that time at all. I decided to run away from my life. So as a Canadian, I was eligible for a program that was a a working exchange program for any other countries in the Commonwealth. And I had really wanted to go to Scotland my whole life. So I ran away to Scotland. I ran away from my life. And I just worked for a little bit while living in Edinburgh. And actually, while I was there, I I performed in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, so take that theater school. (laughs) But while I was there, I had no idea I was a medievalist at heart. I just thought I was going to go back eventually and, and see if I could make a career in Canada, perhaps as an actor. So while I was in Europe, I was looking at all these castles. I was learning a whole bunch of stuff. I was falling more in love with Scotland, especially in the United Kingdom, but I had no idea I was a medievalist. So just over a year later, I came back to Canada. I still had the idea that I was going to be an actor, but I, being a very detail-oriented person, a very practical person, I knew that I wanted to have a backup plan. So I applied to a completely new university, a small one, and I decided to take cultural studies there because I didn't have a theater program, but I really wanted this small university vibe. So I went there and I took cultural studies and English as a double major. And while I was there, I met a really great guy and I got married and I thought, well, 
I love acting, but I love it so much I can do it in my spare time. And maybe what I want to do is become a high school teacher. So I finished my degree and I applied to Teachers College, the one that was close enough, and I didn't get in. <laughs> I had made the perfect application. You know, my marks were really great. I had all of the volunteer experience. I was going to be a high school teacher, and I didn't make it into Teachers College, which was only a surprise to me because I had worked so hard to make sure that I made my application perfect. Uh, but I mean, that didn't work out either. So I was talking with some friends. You know, I had my honors degree in hand. I was talking with some friends who were going to do their master's degrees. Um, and I said out loud, I think if I did a master's degree, it would be in medieval literature. And it just fell out of my mouth. I had not thought about it. It was never something that I had considered as a career. I was going to be a high school teacher. But it just fell out of my mouth and I realized it was the truth. In the course of my undergraduate degree, I had taken a course in medieval literature with Joanne Finden, who's an amazing person if you haven't come across her in our field. She writes about uh, medieval romance and Celtic stuff as well as Mary Magdalene. And when I took her class, I didn't realize that you could actually have a career doing medieval studies. So that was a big surprise to me. And I thought, well, this is really cool. But I was going to be a teacher. So talking with these friends, and it just fell out of my mouth, I was going to, I wanted to do a master's degree in medieval studies. It made me realize that, that I actually did want to do that. So with my degree in hand, I actually did a victory lap at university. And what I did was I piled on courses. So I took everything medieval that I could. I took Old English, I took Latin, I took all of the things, really studied hard. And I applied for a master's degree at the University of Toronto. Now, that said, I had student loans, as so many of us do. And I wouldn't have been able to do a master's degree without a scholarship. So I applied for one and what, what's funny about this is, and perhaps you might read this as fate or the universe or whatever, but I had run into brick walls and the other things that I had tried. But when it came to applying for a master's degree and this big scholarship, I ended up getting one of the biggest, best scholarships in Ontario to go to University of Toronto and do a master's degree. And I actually got into two programs there. I got into medieval studies and I got into English and decided to take English for a couple of reasons. The first one is, I don't know if it's the same now, but University of Toronto at that time had really extreme Latin requirements and I only had sort of basic Latin. I wasn't sure I was gonna finish my master's degree and manage that Latin requirement. So that was part of my thinking. And the other part was, I thought, well, the job market is not amazing. If I get an English degree, maybe I will have a better chance at getting a job. So I took English, but in the course of this one year master's degree, there was a fast track one. I just loaded up with courses that were cross referenced with the Center for Medieval Studies. So all my courses were medieval history courses, except for the ones on Shakespeare and one on the 18th century, which I kind of bombed a little bit. And I still resent that century to this day. So although my degree is technically in English, it has as many courses in medieval studies as the people who were taking medieval studies did, uh, but I didn't have to do Latin. So I was trying to hedge my bets again and have an English degree because I thought it would be better for my career. So I left University of Toronto. I was planning to have my children, and then I was going to come back and do a PhD. And I did have my children in that break. But at that time, I was looking around and realizing my friends who had gone and done their master's earlier or my friends who I'd met in the graduate program at University of Toronto were having a really hard time finding work as PhDs. So I thought, well, I don't know if I want to get a PhD because there are no careers there anyway. So I was looking around to see what I could do, maybe save some money and then go back. I hadn't really decided. So again, you know, here's this this path that I'm taking in medieval studies and, and none of it is linear. It's never been linear to this point. It's still not linear. So I was working part-time raising a couple of toddlers and I started to apply to community colleges and I applied to one in the English department and um, I didn't get that job but my resume filtered through so that a year later I was called to teach a sort of remedial program to get people up to speed before they took college. So I, I went to work at a community college 
teaching basic English. And in the meantime, I started writing a blog and I called it the Five Minute Medievalist. And I was trying to share that information that I'd learned as an undergraduate and as a graduate student about what we get wrong about the medieval world, because I think people have an interest in it. Obviously, you're here now listening, but everyone had so many misconceptions about it. So I started writing this blog while I was working at community college and looking around to see if there were any um, openings in college where I could teach English and really get into medieval stuff through that route. I ended up working in the college system for several years. And what was funny about that was because my background was cultural studies and English and history kind of all mixed up, even though I kept being made redundant through that contract system that people who are teaching in post-secondary recognize so clearly through these short contracts, I kept getting made redundant or I would be transferred to another department. So I taught different courses in different departments for a few years trying to find that elusive full-time job and I thought if I work hard enough I will get this job Um, but as many people who are teaching in post-secondary recognize it is very difficult to do that and you're up against a lot of things you're up against a whole saturated market of other people who have degrees advanced degrees I had a master's they were taking people with PhDs as well Plus, there is nepotism involved often in this system. So, you know, you're up against a lot of things. And so I kept getting bounced around. I kept getting work, but it wasn't that full-time work. So in the meantime, I'm writing this blog called The 5-Minute Medievalist. And one day, I was on Twitter, and I get this DM from a guy called Peter Kinechny. And he says he's from this website called Medievalist.net. And it turns out he lives in the next town over. Would it be cool to meet up? and have a coffee and talk about medieval stuff. So I, I thought, cool, that sounds like fun. <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit trepidatious because this is somebody that I met on Twitter. I'd never met him before. I was not sure what he expected <laughs> from this meeting. So I remember dressing very carefully for it and asking my husband at the time, like, does this look like a date outfit? Because <laughs> I don't want him to mistake this for a date. So that's how it happened. I ended up meeting Peter from Medievalist.net at a coffee shop because he reached out to me on Twitter. So again, this is not any official channels. It was not any official letters. It was kind of a strange thing that just happened. It turned out that Peter had found me by reading my blog. Now my blog, I was writing really intermittently. And remember, I had a couple of toddlers at home. I was teaching a lot of hours, if not, you know, officially full time, of course, Teaching any amount is going to eat up your whole life. So I was really writing intermittently, but I had a following of, you know, a few hundred readers, which is pretty good, I think, considering how rarely I posted. So Peter had read those and he wanted to pick them up for medievalist.net. So I said, okay. So he reposted things that I'd already written on Medievalist.net, and then he started to commission new articles for Medievalist.net. And at the time, he paid me free books (laughs) because publishers will sometimes send books to Medievalist.net. So I would write a post and I would get a free Medieval Studies book, which I was delighted with because much of this time I was teaching in English and Cultural Studies, and I was trying to keep my hand in the medieval world and learn more about it. So this was a good deal for a while. But it's a lot of work to write an article, especially when you have a day job and kids. So I had eventually decided I wasn't going to do this anymore. (laughs) So uh, the Christmas following when Peter started picking up my articles, I met him and his business partner at the time, Sandra Alvarez, who now runs the Medieval Magazine. And we met for a coffee. It was my first time meeting Sandra. And I was going to quit. (laughs) And that at that point... They said they had some money to pay me. So I started to be paid for my five-minute medievalist articles just a little bit. But it was enough to make me realize that people liked them, that they wanted more of them, and that they were worth something. And I really think that it's good to work for exposure, but it's even better to work and be paid for your work because it's it's really good, I think, for your self-esteem to start getting paid for your work and seeing that it's valued. So if we fast forward a couple of years, I'm writing regularly for Medievalist.net. It's always a side gig, but I decide I'm going to put together a compilation of these articles and sell it as a book. 
I had never thought of myself as a writer because it's hard, <laughs> because it's hard to write. I thought I wasn't very good at it. So Peter was really pushing me to be a writer. And my husband at the time was saying, you know, that this work was valuable, that people liked it. So I decided I was going to put together a compilation. And I did that uh, in 2016. And it ended up being called The Five Minute Medievalist. And I did everything for that. It's self-published. So I created the cover. I got some help with the logo. That was something that I had made myself. I did all of that stuff on Photoshop. I uploaded it. And I kind of hit submit on Amazon and that first day it sold like dozens and dozens of copies and I was stunned and I cried <laughs> this, there's gonna be crying of like happiness and sadness through this journey and I had never thought of myself as being an author before that time I thought I was just writing something kind of fun and frivolous and here were people who were actually buying my book online and that was a really important moment for me but it was something that I really came to gradually it was not a goal that I had you know as a child writing history books so again it was something that that was that was not a given but it was a project I tried and that worked out for me and that that ended up changing my life so if we fast forward again a few years later, I'm a single mom. I have to make that adjustment to my life plan. So I started working as an acquisitions editor at Arc Humanities Press. I was still trying to find some college work, but it is so precarious that I was trying to find something else. So I started doing acquisitions work for Arc Humanities Press and that was a really great experience for me. I was involved with some really great people, some really amazing books, uh, one of which is the one about craft beer. Noelle Phillips was on the podcast talking about that. That was one of the books that I was involved with. So a lot of really great stuff. But I learned that while I'm pretty good at being able to sense trends and maybe see what's coming around the corner, I wasn't really great at acquisitions. <laughs> so while I had fun at that job, um, we mutually decided very amicably that maybe I was better suited to do other things. So I left that job and uh, everyone at ARC has my utmost respect and I think it goes both ways. But I mean, I had to realize, I had to find out that, you know, that was something I wasn't particularly great at. In the meantime, I've told you that, you know, my life is personally going through some stuff. I had tried working at our humanities at the same time I was writing for medievalist.net at the same time I was finding college courses and in the middle of all of this because perhaps I'm a little bit crazy I decided to start a little project called the medieval podcast I started this project not knowing anything about podcasting what I had was a gut feeling that a podcast should exist to serve this community and I really wanted to listen to a podcast that wasn't just like the other ones that weren't specifically medieval. I wanted to hear someone that was talking to the people who are writing really great stuff, really forward thinking and innovative stuff in our field. I wanted this podcast to exist. And so I thought, well, I guess I can do it, <laughs> right? Somebody's got to do it. I had realized through writing and experimenting through many years writing for Medievalist.net that I could sometimes have a good sense of what people wanted to know about the medieval world. So I thought maybe I could do this podcast and maybe I can make it a success. Peter also wanted to have something for medievalist.net, but I was trying to decide how I could make a career for myself that I could have some agency over. I think probably from coming from the post-secondary world where you don't have a lot of agency over your career, I wanted to see that I could have some agency over this. So Peter and I worked out a deal where I would have complete creative control over this podcast. I would create it, I would do all the work, and then he would distribute it. So Peter likes to think of this podcast and perhaps some of the things on Medievals.net as being kind of like Netflix, right? So he distributes the, the stuff that people are creating around the medieval world. And that's how this podcast ended up working. I thought that it might have a better chance of reaching people if I partnered with, with Medievals.net. So that's how I've done it. So still being an indie I'm partnered with Medievals.net to bring you this podcast, but it was something that, again, I had no idea what I was doing 
when it came to this kind of thing. And if you listen to the first couple episodes, it's really evident. All I had was gut, I suppose. And so I started writing to some people I knew and some people I didn't to get interviews for this podcast. And I started to do that. And I think if you've listened to this podcast from the beginning, you'll hear some of the things I tried sponsorships and eventually ads to try and make this work, to try and make it have legs, to try and support myself as an indie historian. So you've been part of that process if you've been listening from the beginning or if you caught up on past episodes. Being a mom, I still needed stability, so I was still too hesitant to step too far away from the college system. And right before March of 2020, I had just had an interview at a community college for a full-time position. It was looking really good. And then COVID happened and it completely obliterated that opportunity. So I, we've all we've all been there, right? And that's why I decided to fall back on all of the skills that I had picked up from teaching at college and teaching on a digital platform. And I fell back on all of the knowledge that I had gained over, you know, over a decade studying the medieval world. And then I created the medieval masterclass. And even though that uh, is not continuing in the form that it took, that saved my life. And that was another thing that I just kind of created because I had to, leaning on skills that I'd collected over time. So that brings us to right now, where my work consists of writing books and writing, sometimes writing articles for Medievalist.net and doing this podcast for you. So the support that you are giving on Patreon, as well as listening through the ads, that is making it possible for me to make a living doing this while selling books, while selling digital stuff. But I'm hoping that what you're realizing listening to this whole story start to finish is that a lot of this stuff comes from just being scrappy. (laughs) It is a little bit scary for someone who always has a plan or always needs a plan to feel safe to keep jumping from project to project. But if there's anything I've learned over time, over the course of my life, is that the best laid plans, gang after glade, right? <laughs> the best laid plans are going to go totally belly up every once in a while and you have to just roll with the punches and lean on the skills that you've picked up over time. Now, this is the kind of revelatory <laughs> moment that I was warned against when I started teaching in post-secondary. They were like, never let people see you bleed. Never let them see you cry. Never let them see you too much because then they'll find your soft underbelly and they will go after you. So perhaps I am sharing too much information, but I'm telling you this to show you how many brick walls that I've hit in order to get here. I've usually hit them with my face, but if everything had gone as planned, I might have been an actor in small bit parts, speaking other people's words instead of my words. Or I might have been teaching 30 people at a time in high school instead of talking to literally millions in the job that I'm doing now. And every dead end has given me skills that I've been able to reapply and reuse. So learning how to act has helped me be comfortable in front of the microphone or speaking in front of a classroom. Taking cultural studies kept me fed when I couldn't find work in English or medieval studies. My English degree helped me put out a book that I self-published. It helped me work on exercises on a grammar textbook, which I was part of. It made me a pretty clean writer, which is something that I learned through actually making mistakes over and over and over again, pretty much weekly for years, writing for Medievalist.net. And then learning how to use social media is the reason that I ended up meeting Peter and getting work and having affiliations with Medievalist.net, which have made this possible. So it's not a linear story. It's a completely messy story. And I'm only telling you this not because I love talking about myself, because I really don't. If you've been listening to the podcast at this point, you know how rarely I talk about myself. But here we are. I'm telling you this because here we are in September, the beginning of a new school year. And if you are not sure of your direction right now, or if you've been rudely forced to take a new direction, as I have many times, you are definitely not alone in this. There is no 
educational path, there's no career path, there's no life path that is ever actually linear. And I want you to hear me loudly and clearly when I say there is absolutely no shame in taking a new direction or a new path, no matter what anyone might say to you about it. It's your life and you can take an entirely new direction and you can take those steps without actually knowing what you're doing (laughs) and see what happens because that is the whole reason that you are hearing me in your earphones right now. So just remember that you already have all the skills and the talents and the toughness to take on those new challenges that you're facing in this new school year, no matter what your position is, if you're in education or outside of education, you already have everything you need. Just get out there and make me proud and do your absolute best and just see where life takes you. And I promise you that there are people behind you that absolutely love you and want you to succeed. And I'm one of them. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, uh, I've been working on a piece about a chronicle from a place called Quindlinburg Abbey. And the unusual thing about this chronicle is written by women. I love that. Yeah, it's one of the few that we have, few that have survived past the Middle Ages. But it's a really interesting look at the abbey and its influence on the kind of wider region. Because this is a Ottonian Germany and it's founded really by like the elite women there. So like the queens and, and princesses, they're like really uh, running it as abbesses. And it really shows how influential and political these women are. And that's something you don't get in like other chronicles. So I've been really kind of fascinated reading through this and the similarities and differences with the other kind of chronicles you just see that would just be written by men. Yeah. You don't hear about the influence of women often in the chronicles written by men is what you're saying (laughs) yeah exactly exactly you know she did this she did that she was in this meeting and this is what she said so very fascinating kind of stuff there's an english translation it took me forever to get from like a small publisher out of poland so i'm getting a chance to enjoy and read it and write about it awesome that's something to look forward to for sure a lot of our authors have just sent me pieces. So we've got like Adam Alley. He's got a two-parter on the Abbasid Civil Wars. Mm-hmm. Catherine Walton is doing a piece on Are Fairy Tales Medieval? Nice. Her short answer is no. And then she has a long answer. And also we just put up today, uh, Yoav Tarosh, his oddest article ever, he tells me. It's about UFOs <laughs> in the sagas. Wait, are they building pyramids and stuff? Oh, they're building Viking mounds. Oh, there you go. He did point out that like a Viking mound is uh, kind of shaped like an alien ship, right? (laughs) Well, that is going to be all over the news cycle by the end of next week, I swear. I hope so. It is a really fun piece. And like, all right, all right. Could it be? (laughs) As he points out, what's the most popular shows on History Channel? Vikings and ancient aliens Mm -hmm. put them together and what do you got i guess we'll find out what you got now hey we're kind of prepping for next week and it's all about this new lord of the rings show Mm -hmm. i haven't had a chance to see it yet but you have so what's your initial thoughts i loved it i loved it i know that that's gonna be maybe too simple for a lot of people on the internet who are gonna pick it apart Mm -hmm. but honestly it's the type of medievalism that people have been getting away from for the last 20 years like hopeful and heroic and all of those type of things the best in people and so it's people against kind of outside forces from what we know right now from watching the two first episodes so it's nice to see that kind of hopefulness and people trying their best to make things better even though you know it's not gonna go perfectly because i mean you have to have some drama i'm gonna like definitely check this out over the weekend i'm sure it'll get all gritty and grimy for episode three just for you (laughs) just to prove me wrong nope nope i have hopes that it's gonna stay shiny and and beautiful beautiful to look at i hope you like it i do too and you were just telling me some really awesome news about patreon right what's going on on patreon oh you know we we were at the highest level ever we're approaching like 500 people signed up the numbers have been really good and i've been really surprised like about how a lot of people are choosing to do an annual subscription right about three or four months ago i decided to put that thing in if you sign up you get 10 percent discount and like oh so many people have been just kind of signing up put me down for one year 
even if it's like a one dollar a month works out to about ten dollars a year they have uh, you know been kind of signing up on droves i'm really really appreciative of that yeah for sure i mean this podcast isn't the only thing that's fueled by medievalist.net's patreon right indeed indeed like we've got other podcasts we got uh, all our writers and this is a way of being a part of our community and saying hey this is what should be there q and a's ask questions about the content or about the middle ages it's a great way of having this little community for me to kind of bounce ideas back and forth off mm -hmm, absolutely i am aware that a lot of the patrons that are coming to patreon for medievalist.net are doing that because they're supporting the podcast so i'm super appreciative and i think that the people who are signing up for a year membership are casting in their votes for another year of the medieval podcast and i just really appreciate the fact that people not only are expecting you know another year of content but that they're looking forward to it so i'm really appreciative of that yeah i just got a message two days ago a person signed up she said i loved hearing the podcast about london's coroner's roles mm -hmm. and i just signed up from that and like now i have to listen to all the other podcasts so i was <laughs> i was really excited and like wow all right yeah there's a lot there's a lot of podcasts for her to listen to so i hope she enjoys them but yeah i just really appreciate that kind of vote of confidence people are expecting to like the content and that they're expecting to like it for the next year. And I'm going to take some credit for that because I think some of it's fueled by the podcast. So thanks everybody for your patronage. Really appreciate that. I thank you as well. Yes. And thank you, Danielle. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. It's really nice to have people supporting medieval studies and having this out in the public. So it's great for everybody. It's win-win. Woohoo! Yeah. Well, thanks, Peter, for stopping by, and we will check in with you about Lord of the Rings next week. Thanks. See you then. For everything from autobiographies to the Ottoman Empire, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. You can find my digital downloads at DanielleSabalski.com slash shop. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. Yeah.